But now, really, I'm here to make a very special welcome to uh, four very special uh, <coughs> guests we have. Firstly, our chairman and facilitator for tonight, Paula Morris. Uh, Paula, of course, is a distinguished New Zealand novelist uh, and uh, has major influence in literary circles. So, a special welcome to you. Thank you. Secondly, David. David Hastings here is, I guess, has the word journalist. I checked his fingernails, they've still got black marks under them. <laughs> it's a sign he's been in the, in, in the press in both Australia and New Zealand for longer than he cares to admit. Our third speaker is Alex Calder, over there on the right. Uh, and Alex, at least on your left, of course, my right. Uh, Alex is a professor of English and of uh, drama at Auckland University. He's published books on people like Manning, the old Maori, uh, Pākehā Māori of New Zealand, and some very interesting material indeed. So we really have three very special people here from Auckland University. The fourth guest we have tonight is just about to move on stage. Uh, is he here? No, he's about to appear. Brecken, can you make your appearance now? <laughs> A very special Devonportonian, Brecken Carter. <laughs> Brecken is going to play a piece which is particularly applicable to tonight. Uh, I won't say any, any more than that, but it, uh, we're very privileged to have him here. And don't be disturbed if he makes a fast exit afterwards because he has a, another prior engagement. Thank you. I mean, you could play instead of me if you like. Yeah, everybody would leave if I did that. Okay. Um. 
Barbara Brecken. Thank you very much. That was Brecken Carter. Maybe I shouldn't have had wine before we began tonight. So kia ora everyone, I'm Paula Morris. I'm very pleased to be here at Devonport Library. You always have really excellent events and very delicious cheese straws, may I say, as well as Anzac biscuits. I'd also like to thank Lynn Dawson for making the fantastic poppy I'm wearing now. Oh, it's not you, but it's her elves. She has elves. I think slavery is not allowed in New Zealand, <laughs> Lynn. But tonight on the eve of Anzac Day, um, a century on from the, the last year of the, of the First World War, uh, we're celebrating the launch of two very important books. Now, when I was a child uh, commemorating Anzac Day, with my family, we go to the Domain. Auntie Hopi would be there selling poppies. I don't know if any of you remember her. And there were still veterans, old fellas, who were alive to attend the ceremonies and tell their stories. And now there are just the stories and memories of the stories, the private legacies of war, the personal costs, the family tales and the family secrets. Now every year, you know, on Anzac Day we pledge to remember them, or to remember those who fought and didn't return, but it gets harder, the generations more distant, the human experience of the First World War, increasingly part of history, part of the thick clouds of the past. Now, David Hastings, to my right here, in Odyssey of the Unknown Anzac, quotes from the Iliad, the wind scatters one year's leaves on the ground, but the forest burgeons and puts out others as the season of spring comes round. So it is with men. One generation grows on and another is passing away. When I read those lines, it reminded me of one of my favorite uh, Philip Larkin poems, The Trees. Is it that they are born again and we grow old? No, they die too. Their yearly trick of looking new is written down in rings of grain. So with every cycle, we have more rings of grain, more deaths, more births, more wars, more secret histories and accounts of years past hidden within. So it's my pleasure and privilege tonight to launch two new books that bring the past and its people back to us in vivid detail. Odyssey of the Unknown Anzac and Gallipoli to the Somme. <coughs> I was thinking about these books and I was thinking of the James Agee book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men because without books like these, we'll forget the epic feats demanded of ordinary New Zealanders, often very young men far from home. Without books like these, we may forget who we were and what we did, and therefore we won't understand who we've become. We may also forget the individual stories of men who were not generals or politicians or heroes or villains, but this person and that, real and complex, trying to make it through another day and trying to make it home. In David Hastings' book, we follow a detective's trail, in a way, in search of one man. And I should have asked uh, David before we began the session how to pronounce his name, but I think it's George McQuay. It's McQuay. It's McQuay, George McQuay. <laughs> From a Taranaki town to Gallipoli to the Western Front and then ultimately to a Sydney mental hospital, a straggler, as David describes him, finding his way home from war, and overcoming great odds to make it. In Gallipoli to the Somme, Recollections of a New Zealand Infantryman, Alex Calder's new edition brings the words and experiences of the mathematical genius Alexander Aitken, a man Alex describes as as humane as he was extraordinary to a new generation of New Zealanders. We're lucky this Anzac Day, this Anzac Day Eve, to access such insights and such rich histories, and I thank Auckland University Press for publishing them. Uh, now, because these books really demand our attention, demand discussion, we're having a different sort of launch tonight. Usually it launches, the launcher says a few things, the launchees stand up and thank everyone they've ever known, and then <laughs> you all go and drink the wine and buy a couple of books, but Tonight, I think you'll, be, you'll want to probably buy five or six books each tonight um, because we're going to talk now about the two books and the men they reveal to us, the men who witnessed the traumas of the Great War. And I'd written originally who managed to survive, but they both managed to survive and not to survive in other ways. Um, so the writers are David Hastings, a, a historian, acclaimed writer and a former journalist, and my colleague Alex Calder, I get his title right, otherwise I'll never hear the end of it, Associate Professor of English 
at the University of Auckland and please welcome them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit down now, I'm afraid, and take the mic with me and you'll have to bear with us because we'll pass the mic to each other so you can hear everything, even if you can't see us. So I, David, I'm going to start with you. Alex, we'll have to come back to you to hear about the meaning of the violin, okay? Alex has brought his own book just to read, you know. Quite <laughs> right. Now, David, just to start off with, you've talked about reading the book uh, Death's Man by Dennis Winter yes. and how it opened your eyes to the possibilities of history from below, meaning not the point of view of someone famous, but of the individual soldier. And I wondered if we could start off tonight by you talking about what drew you to the story of George McQuay. Um, I discovered George McQuay when I was doing an assignment for the Herald uh, to mark the 100th anniversary of the Gallipoli landings, which was obviously published in 2015. And I wanted to find something that extended the experience of Gallipoli, the lingering consequences of what happened on that day and in the First World War generally. And so I started looking for examples of shell shock. And if you go into paper, papers past and you put in the words shell shock, you will find hundreds and hundreds of incredibly sad and touching stories about the aftershocks of war uh, on a personal level. But the story of George McQuay was absolutely eye-popping because he went to Gallipoli, he went to the Western Front, he disappeared and he reappeared 12 years later in the Sydney Mental Hospital, apparently with no memory of who he was or how he got there. And I thought, this is an interesting story and the story that was told at the time was there was a shell explosion and he was partly buried by the trench caving in on top of him and when they pulled him out, his mind was a blank a complete blank. But there were a few loose ends that didn't quite add up. Contradictory stories, contradictory details, and of course the question of what became of him after he returned to New Zealand. And I thought, this is worth researching. If you can find out what the real story of George McQuay was, it would be worth writing. Uh, it would be worth a book. Thanks, David. There are lots of things we need to talk about, but I just wanted to turn to Alex briefly and say that Alexander Aitken was quite a different man. He was extraordinary in many ways. And so, again, I wondered if you would tell us a little bit about him and why he was so extraordinary. Um, Alexander Aitken is probably one of the most gifted New Zealanders there's ever been. Um, he had the most extraordinary capacity to perform mental calculations. Um, so think of a nine-digit number and another nine-digit number and imagine multiplying them in your head. Well, he could do something like that in about three seconds. Um, he had pi off by heart to a thousand places. And if you were to say, oh, OK, about place number you know, no, you wouldn't say place number one, but you might go five, seven, eight, six, two, and he would pick up the sequence um, um, from, from any point. Um, he topped the New Zealand scholarships exams by zillions of marks um, as, a, as a seventh former. Um, and so this is someone with uh, an extraordinary brain going through experiences that we know a lot about and we know in rather familiar ways. So we think of the mud, we think of um, uh, a kind of a, a, a version of World War One that comes down to us from what we learnt at school about Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon or watched on TV on Blackadder um, and these, this, this the inherited version that we have about World War One um, has a has all sorts of truths to it, but it's not the only truth. And his experience of the war, and his personality recording these these sorts of events, 
really makes um, quite a big difference. But maybe perhaps I should start by explaining why it is that we started off with that piece of music that we did. So um, I'll just read half a paragraph from chapter one. Um, Alexander Aitken is on board the Wallachra on his way to Egypt. Um, and he's, I don't know, I reckon someone probably stole it um, from somewhere in Western Australia. Um, but all of a sudden there was a violin on the ship. What did they come to do with the violin? Well, they had a raffle. The violin lay in its case beside me, not originally mine, but one in a raffle on board ship some days after we had left Albany in Western Australia by my cabin mate and old schoolfellow, R.J. Mournsell, and handed by him to me. Mediocre in tone and cheap, it was wonderful to have in such a place. Sooner or later, I would have to part with it. It was excess luggage, contrary to regulations, and could not be expected to survive the strict kit inspections that would precede our disembarking on Gallipoli. I was determined in spite of this to smuggle it along as far as I could, and had begun to print a hopeful list of names on the bay's lining of the case. I added one now so that the list showed Indian Ocean, Aden, Suez, Cairo, Zaitun, Alexandria. The violin was by this time almost a platoon mascot, while the piece most in demand, Dvorak's Humoresque in G major, was becoming what in later years would be called the signature tune. And so that's what you um, just heard uh, a, a few minutes ago. Um, uh, I probably shouldn't, but I'll, I'll just... I have a note on that. I mean, when something like that's mentioned, the editor has to add a note. Um, and I found there was a columnist in a music magazine in 1910 um, who explained the appeal of Dvorak's humoresque. It is used in recitals by the world's greatest violinists and never fails to make a telling hit with even the most uncultured audience. <laughs> Not that that's us. <laughs> I think we'll stick with voyage, Voyages Out at the moment because Alexander Aitken acquired a violin that he then managed to unbelievably get all around Europe and eventually was returned to New Zealand, and maybe we can talk about that later. But for George McQuay, the voyage out was the first sign of troubles ahead. Um, you talk quite compellingly, David, about the pressure on young men at the time. You talk about the troll, the white feather trolls, basically, you know, forcing young men to, to sign up. And that on the board the ship out going over to Egypt, friendships were forged, but there was also the dark side of mateship, and George was already out of it. So would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there was really intense pressure on young men from the very earliest stages of the First World War to enlist. And if you were young, strong and fit and you didn't, you could be publicly abused or you might get a letter in the mail, usually anonymous, calling you a coward and a shirker. And the psychological pressure on young men such as George was intense to enlist. Um, and there's plenty of evidence. Although George was not a great uh, literate man like uh, Alexander Aitken, there is very good evidence to show that he was deeply affected by the campaign of who I call the white feather trolls, mm -hmm. because they're trolls in the same way that people on social media today are tro trolls. And they normally hide behind anonymity while accusing other people of being cowards. Mm. So he enlisted and it became very apparent on the voyage of the ship, the Monganui, on the, as Alexander was to do uh, a few months later, on the way to e uh, Egypt, that he was becoming uh, separated from the other men. Mm. 
there was a problem. And the problem culminated with a medical board recommending that he should be discharged from the army on the basis that he was not mentally fit. For some reason, this decision was never acted on. And there is very strong reason to believe that the failure to act on this decision was subsequently covered up when he was finally returned to New Zealand in 1928. He was a man who was put in an intolerable position um, by the authorities for whatever reason and they certainly didn't want anybody to know about it. So both men in these books went to Gallipoli. <coughs> so would you, Alex, talk a little bit about Alexander Aitken's um, experience there and how he wrote about it? So being in the sixth reinforcements, um, uh, Alexander Aitken was fortunate to arrive in Gallipoli only in the last uh, five weeks of the campaign. And he joined up with the remnant of the main body and all the reinforcements, two, three, four, and five, uh, on the island of Lemnos. And there's the most astonishing passage where he describes arriving on Lemnos at night um, to join up with the main body of the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. They haven't heard the news. They don't really know what happened in August at Chanuk Bear and places like that. They're expecting to be walking into the kind of army camp that they were at at Trentham. There'll be people chatting and it'll be noisy and all of that kind of thing. But in the dark, they arrive and they're just a couple of marquees. And it's only nine o'clock, but everyone's in bed. Um, one person sort of staggers out just to take a look at them and goes back. And they're all feeling surprised and miffed. Where are the others, they, they think. And it's only in the morning um, when when they can see by light, that they realise this is all that there is left. Um, so many were killed, so many were sick, so many were wounded. Um, and he, he kind of asks you to perform something like an exercise in um, mental arithmetic, just to work out how many uh, uh, people are missing. <clears throat> But it's sort of showing you this mathematical brain responding to um, what he sees. And one of the details that I've found fascinating is, I mean, these are young men the same age as him, um, but he describes them as old. Um, they're tired, they're exhausted. And he says that they seem to be suffering from what he calls reverse agoraphobia. And he notices, I mean, as a New Zealander might, that people who've come through an earthquake become frightened of going, in, go, uh, going back inside a house. Now, with those soldiers, it was the exact opposite. They were frightened of being out in the open. Um, their bodies had been trained, really, to need cover. And so, um, in these very subtle ways, he sort of just registers the the first impression of what it was like to join up with those with those um, those people from the main body and the early reinforcements uh, there on the island of Lemnos. Alex, was it in your book that I read that they joined up at some point with the Aucklanders who've named a particular... <coughs> maybe it's in your book, David. Uh, they've named their particular line of bivouacs at Gallipoli, Grafton Road... <coughs> Mm. Was it yours or yours? No, it must be. It must be. Mm. They're both denying any knowledge of this. Well, <laughs> just that it was really funny that Aucklanders turn up at Gallipoli like this is Grafton Road, and I wondered if it's because it rose from a gully up, yes. so it reminded them of Grafton Road. Um, okay, uh, David, 
what was George's experience of Gallipoli? Now, I know it's much harder for you because you have to reassemble it without first-person testimony. So how did you go about finding or, or recreating George's experience? Okay, first, uh, George was a little bit ahead of Alexander. He was in the fifth reinforcements who landed on the shores of Gallipoli on the morning that the Wellingtons took Chanuk Bear. <coughs> this was during the August offensive when the fighting was probably as fierce as it ever was. And it's very hard to pinpoint exactly what happened to George and where he was. He's like a face in the crowd who disappears. And this is partly the consequence of the fact that he was not an articulate man like Alexander. But later, when he was in the mental hospital, he did drop some clues. And probably more about his time on Lemnos, where he was when Alexander arrived. He dropped some clues about certain things that happened to him there. And among them uh, was he became even more deeply estranged from his mates uh, than he had been before. He said that somebody in his company uh, either took a dislike to him or accused him of doing something wrong and physically assaulted him. When their time on Lemnos started to come to an end and rumours started to swirl that they were going to go back to Gallipoli, George reported sick. And he never went back to Gallipoli. He was only there for a brief period during the August offensive, where he would have witnessed some of the most terrible sights and sounds uh, imaginable in war. Uh, but he reported sick. And in reporting sick, he got out of returning to Gallipoli. So I've reconstructed what happened to George by following his platoon through Gallipoli uh, through the experience of Gallipoli and how he ended up back on Lemnos. And I've done it by consulting official records and diaries of people who were in the same place as he was at the same time. Um, his reporting sick at the first sign of trouble was the first sign of a pattern emerging in George's behaviour. And that was whenever rumours went round the army that there's going to be a fight, George would have various little stratagems. He would report sick or he'd go absent without leave. And this is what got him into serious trouble later on. And just an aside here, there was someone famous from his same town in Taranaki, Stratford, very involved in Chanuk Bear. Would you talk about that? Yes, George came from Stratford, and Stratford is the home of William Malone, Lieutenant Colonel William Malone, who led the Wellingtons to take Chanuk Bear. Mm -hmm. Their lives intertwined because uh, Malone had acted for the family as a family solicitor when they were younger. Um, George, George's uh, parents had a very unhappy marriage, and when the marriage broke up, uh, Malone acted for the mother. So, so. Uh, the man who was to become one of certainly Stratford's most famous sons, if not New Zealand's most famous sons, crossed paths with the unknown Anzac on a kind of battleground of a failed marriage in, around, in the late 1890s. Their paths almost crossed again uh, that day on Gallipoli. Not quite, but almost. And of course Malone did not survive the war, but George did. Yeah. Could we move ahead with both men to the Western Front now? I mean, I know that there was an interim period where George was back in Egypt and went AWOL for what, over 20 days, yep. yes. Still seriously troubled, but off he went to the Western Front. Um, Alex, in Alexander Aiken's book, as I think I said to you earlier, one of the things that amazed me so much is how vividly and clearly he writes about his experiences in France. And this book was not published until... 1963, but obviously he wrote something quite contemporaneously. Could you talk a little bit about that, about when he wrote these things, um, before we go on to talking about this, the song? Um, well, Gallipoli to the 
psalm is actually a very layered book in terms of its writing. So he was badly wounded um, at the Somme and eventually came back to uh, back home to Dunedin and for about six months every day he'd be going to the outpatients clinic and doing a lot of waiting and so while he was waiting he wrote down a um, little kind of like he called it a letter to nobody in particular that covered his experiences um, he pulled that out again in 1920. Um, he met up with some other uh, friends and remembered more things, added stuff. And then it went back into his bottom drawer and he became uh, a mathematician eventually, went to Scotland where he, has, he spent his professional life. Now in the 1930s, and really not until the 1930s, do we start to, to get the famous war memoirs by people like uh, uh, Robert Graves, Siegfried Sassoon, Edmund Blunden. And under the influence of those, he, he took out his book and did some serious work on it. He put it into, uh, into chapters and he says, this is largely the book you're, you're reading, but I found there's actually quite a lot that goes on uh, in between. Now, as a result of his uh, war uh, experiences, he periodically had um, uh, uh, times when he suffered a, um, a really pretty terrible kind of nervous breakdown. Um, not post-traumatic stress disorder quite, but he had terrible insomnia, and that would link up with depression, and the two would chase each other around. And these nights when he couldn't sleep, um, he would remember and he'd get out the manuscript and he'd work on it. And his wife remembers him doing this uh, uh, periodically. In 1961, he put it all neatly into three kind of school exercise books. Um, that uh, uh, the Hocken Library in um, Dunedin has, and you can you can go and see this in his own handwriting. And then, by a series of accidents, this came to the attention of um, Bernard Ferguson, um, the, the 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 Governor General, and. <coughs> Largely by his enthusiasm and getting in touch with Dan Davin, another military man and, and writer, uh, the book found its way to Oxford University Press uh, and was published in 1963. So it, it was not really written for publication, um, but it did uh, become published and became a, a really big success in 1963. But um, I think the, those classics of the 30s had already made the canon of World War I writing. And so after a time, I think it began to, to, to fade from view. Um, not entirely. If you're from Otago, you might know it. If you know about music and maths, you might know it. But, I, um, but it's, um, it, it, now it's coming back for you know, everyone to read. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alex. So the Somme ended Alexander Aitken's war, I mean, in, in 1916. And for George McQuay, it was the end of things as well, in a way, too, because that's where he deserted. Would you, would you talk about that, please? Yes. Uh, George, of course, was in the Auckland Infantry Battalion. Alexander was in the Otagos. Um, their paths came very close to crossing again, uh, uh, at Armentier in the early phases of the Battle of the Somme. And George, uh, you know, once again, rumours started to sweep the camp that there was going to be a fight. And George, who'd gone AWOL for 22 or 28 days in Egypt, which was almost tantamount to desertion, um, again reported sick. And he was diagnosed with melancholia which I thought when I first read it, oh, melancholia, you know, 
you got the blues and it's quite nice and it's quite pleasant. And in fact, it's not quite nice or pleasant at all. It's a very profound depression. They took him out of the front line for a little while and then they sent him back just before the Auckland Infantry Battalion came under a ferocious barrage from the Germans on the night of July the 3rd, 1916. If George was telling the truth, and I believe he was, uh, that he was buried by a shell, this was the night that it happened. A number of people from his company were in fact buried. Um, uh, one of his uh, comrades kept a diary and described in graphic detail what happened. Large numbers killed, people buried, it was sheer chaos. And as it worked on the Western Front, you'd spend a little time in the front line and you'd come back to the reserve trenches and then if you were lucky, you'd go back to your billet. Well, the Aucklanders, after a little while, were withdrawn to their billets and then they were sent back into the front line. Um, about the time that Alexander Aitken describes an incredibly disastrous raid by the Otagos on the enemy lines. It was then that they noticed George was missing. Uh, originally they said he deserted on July the 15th and later they amended this to July the 13th. It sounded like he just said, I can't take this anymore and he disappeared. Um, he was picked up indeterminate time, but I think about two weeks later, um, wearing a digger's hat, an Aussie digger's hat, and calling himself Private George Brown, number 2384 of the uh, Australian Imperial Force. And that's how he ended up in the Australian system. And with George, and, and again, I keep stressing the contrast between George and Alexander, is Alexander has got this crystal clear memory. Uh, George, they said, his memory was a complete blank. In fact, it wasn't a complete blank. It was shattered. It was in pieces. And he didn't know how to put it back together again. The question for me was, did he deliberately say that he was an Australian? Was this a, a calculated gamble or was it something different? And for Talk about desertion. Yeah. Penalty. Yeah. So it looked to me originally that this was a calculated gamble. Why? Because the Kiwis executed deserters. The Australians didn't. So if you were going to be a Kiwi deserting, say you're an Aussie, <laughs> you'll be right. You'll survive. And there were a number of uh, desertions about the same time as George. There were four of them sentenced to death. And I did a little kind of calculation. If George had been caught by the New Zealanders, would he have been executed? Well, the four who were sentenced to death, who deserted about the same time that he did, two were executed and two were not executed. As far as I can see, the distinguishing factor was their record. The ones who were executed had bad form for going absent without leave. And I'm afraid to say that was George. He had a long, long bad track record of going AWOL. There's a real chance that if he had been caught by the Kiwis, he wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't be talking about him. I was very interested to read that. I didn't want to make any conclusions about Australians <laughs> not killing deserters. But now, Alex, you talked about how Alexander Aitken suffered in later years, even though in many ways he came back to finish his education, to get a, a, a very good job at the University of Edinburgh. And I mean, his life superficially seemed very good, but there was one line that really struck me from his book. He talked about his last day of active service in 1916 at Goose Alley, and he said, its effects will remain for the rest of my life. And you said it wasn't PTSD, but surely it was the great slumps he went into were a relic of war, do you think? Mm. Um, 
Yes, and it's not a matter of, of my speculation. There are letters um, uh, where he describes this himself. Um, someone writes him a note of sympathy because he hasn't been at a university committee meeting or something, and, and he explains that um, he's, he's in another of his states. The, it's as if the... Maybe something's happened to his balance. The, the world seems to be going sort of rocking. Um, and um, uh, and at the same time, there's this kind of extreme mental focus. Um, and uh, um, and for him, it's it's really horrible. But the thing is, is also that I think it's perhaps just as important with him to remember that his great memory had actually. He would never think of it as, of, of, as a curse. I mean, he was proud of his memory um, and what he could do with it, but he sort of didn't like to be a show-off either. And, um, but he was one of the leading mathematicians um, um, of his day in, in Britain. Um, he played the violin to a really high amateur standard. One of the intriguing things about him afterwards is that there's a suggestion that he may have worked in Hut 6 at Bletchley Park um, in the Second World War. Um, the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography says so with confidence, but I don't think they can. Um, it would make sense that he was there, but there's actually quite a lot of evidence that he was in other places. So it's a tantalising uh, thread. Now, thinking of someone very different, George McQuay, you said, David, that he, he and his actions and his story doesn't fit with our grand rhetoric of war, which is about heroes and sacrifice, men being as mentally strong as they are physically strong. But then you uncover statistics to suggest that George wasn't so different, after all, in terms of people suffering after the war. No, I've, I've looked at... Um some research that had been done, and I can't remember the exact number, certainly thousands of uh, New Zealand men were treated for mental problems after the war. Um, but one, one university thesis suggested really the true number was 98% of the men who came home had mental problems. And look, interestingly, you, you, you get this anecdotally, don't you? When you hear people talk about men who come back from war, they say things like, they're not the same. And I interviewed George's niece, Vivi Cave, uh, in New Plymouth. Uh, Vivi was the only living person I could find who actually knew George. And she, her father was George's brother. Uh, he was an old soldier. There was George. Uh, she had two uncles. And she married a man who went to the Second World War. And she said it. She said they come back different, all of them. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that the idea of sort of the crucial element of this Anzac legend or myth is that the men were not only physically superior, but they were mentally tougher. And they weren't supposed to have mental issues. And that was, you know, obviously in George's case, his mental issues were very, very serious. And they marked the rest of his life. You also talk at the end of the book about the toll the war took on women, not just the ones who are left behind. And um, one of you, I'm sorry, I don't know which side's Robin Hyde's book, talking about the faces of the women seeing their men off, not proud and happy and waving, but actually bereft. And, and gaunt with unhappiness, but also the burden on the women like George's mother and sister who then had to look after him for the rest of his life. Yeah, that, that's right. It's, uh, I, I cited Robin Hyde's uh, description of the departure of the fifth reinforcements because, of course, Robin's, Robin's famous character, Starkey, was on the Monganui at the same time as George. They were quite different characters. Uh, they were both in trouble with the authorities almost from the get-go. But Starkey, because he was a rebel, uh, 
George because he was a lost soul. Um, and Robin describes, based on her interviews with Starkey, this, the departure. Um, but one thing, the, one of the reasons why I called the book The Odyssey of the Unknown Anzac is that it is an odyssey in the true sense of the word. Most people use the term odyssey to say, you know, some long and interesting journey or a quest or something like that. But uh, the Odyssey, the original story, was about a soldier, a straggler from war, trying to make his way home, fighting all kinds of mysterious obstacles and forces that were pre preventing him. But it's not just about the soldier. It's about the people who are left behind, who are left in a state of not knowing what had happened to him. And one of the reasons why the story of George McQuay had such an enormous impact when it first surfaced in 1928, it was only a tiny little story in the Sydney Sun. It was like three lines saying, there's an unknown soldier in Callan Park. And people came from everywhere saying, he's mine. He's mine. Of the 60,000, I think, 60,000 Australian dead, I think it was 25,000 had no known resting place. Of the 18,000 New Zealand dead, 6,000 had no known resting place. All the relatives and the people who were connected to them were thinking, hoping against hope that their man was still alive. And there, there was a rumour, a very strong rumour, that persisted for at least a decade after the war, that the Germans were holding hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war in secret prisoner of war camps. You'd believe it because you wanted your man to be there and that, that would give you the hope that one day they might, might come home. And so the Odyssey... It's not just a story about George McQuay. It's a story about his mother and his sister, mm -hmm. who eventually... Um, I'm not sure that I want to give no, away the no, ending of the book. The <laughs> his mother and his sister... There are a couple of heroes in, the, in this book, but his mother and his sister are two of them. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I want to open it up to questions quite soon. I thought some of you might have questions to ask, but Alex, I know your French translator is here, so would you talk a little bit about um, why you needed one? Why don't you speak French yourself? And, and, and why you needed a translator and how you work together? Um, there's actually not a lot of French, um, but uh, um, my schoolboy French... Um, it's, this, it's, it's at the level where I could probably mistranslate things, <laughs> and uh, um, so um, I'm very grateful to, to Sydney for um, putting me right on um, on several things. There's Sydney there. Oh, I didn't even know I was your French translator. <laughs> <laughs> I've just done a PhD all written in French, so that's probably why Alex thought I might know what I was talking about. Um, but if I can be doing call-outs yes. to uh, people in the audience, is, is Gary T. Um, yeah. the, uh, Professor Gary T. from the Department of Mathematics um, at Auckland University, now retired. Um, he's someone who has kept the memory of Alexander Aitken alive um, for, for decades. And... Um, so, um, uh, as a mathematician, he's, he's written about Aitken's contributions as a mathematician and also written kind of biographical um, pieces about him. So, it's uh, uh, nice to sort of uh, wave and, and, and uh, greet another um, uh, Aitken scholar over there. <laughs> How did you come across the story of Alexander Aiken? Why did you decide on him? Um, well, uh, quite a long time ago, I did an anthology of the best New Zealand non-fiction, and it was called The Writing of New Zealand, and 
as I was doing that, I asked the people around the English department, well, what are some of the things that you really think have to be in this book? And uh, Don Smith, who I think at the time might have been working on his edition of Robin Hyde's Passport to Hell, he said, look, the one you really have to have a, a chapter from is Alexander Aitken's Gallipoli to the Song. And, and he was right, and so I've been a, a fan of that book ever since. So how many years work for you? Uh, in making the edition? Mm -hmm. um, about a year. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Sarah and I went to, uh, to, to France, we <coughs> walked over the battlefields, um, and um, um, I might just say one little thing. Um, it matches what David was saying about the ordinary people. So Aitken's an, an extraordinary person. There's just no two ways about that. But his book is full of people. Mm. And one of the things that I had to deal with as, with as an editor is what do I do when someone's name is mentioned? Um, and if I was to make a footnote, my footnotes would blow out um, um, considerably. So I decided to do something that I, that I called a commemorative index. So for every soldier that's mentioned, um, thanks to the online cenotaph at the museum, which if you don't know about it, it's well worth checking out. Um, it's not all that difficult, um, but it can sometimes be like four days difficult um, <laughs> to uh, match a soldier that Aitken mentions with his regimental number and the story of what happened to him. So at the end of the book, you'll see maybe 150 names. So these are the people he knew and that he mentioned and what happened to them. Of them, only three come back unwounded or not ruined by sickness or not killed. It's an extraordinary um, statistic. Um, there are lots of extraordinary statistics in both books. 1.2 million at the Somme. Unbelievable. I mean, I know I should know that already. David, how long did your book take you? Um, it took me about two and a half years to write. Um, and as with Alex, I had a lot of help from a lot of people, um, especially the family of George McQuay. Um, without them, the book wouldn't have been possible um, because Again, contrasting him, him with Alexander, his story was buried in the files of various mental hospitals around the world. And the only real way to get to him would be to get to those files, which of course were sealed, um, sealed for 100 years after his death. The only way to unlock them was to get the support of the family, and which they very graciously did, um, especially his niece, Vivi Cave, who was, tech, or who was, she's passed away since, um, was his next of kin, but other members of his family as well, and also sharing with me the little extra anecdotes that filled in the story about what happened to George for the rest of his life. Because when he came back to New Zealand, he sort of appeared in the headlines in a blaze of publicity, and when he was repatriated, um, everybody forgot about him straight away and he disappeared. But there's one other person that I want to uh, say a very, very special thanks to because I got the psychological records or the psychiatric records of this man and I was trying to make sense of it and I was reading about the history of psychiatry and what the doctor, trying to understand what the doctors would have understood and to be quite honest with you, trying to grasp mental illness and the history of mental illness is like trying to nail jelly to a wall. In most things, I reckon that I can sort of fix a state in the ground and begin to work around it and gain an understanding. But this was a complete mystery to me. Um, so we used to have a tra tradition at the Herald where you said if you were working on a, a big, serious story, what you needed was a rabbi. Not a Jewish religious man, but somebody who knew 
intimately knew the subject and could guide you so that you didn't say anything outrageously stupid. And uh, my rabbi was Dr. Fred Sundrum, who's standing up there at the back from the School of Psychological Me Medicine at Auckland University, who showed endless patience in looking at drafts and saying, no, 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 you've got that completely wrong. <laughs> and suggesting other ideas that could enhance the context of um, George's condition while he was in the mental hospital. There is one other thing I suppose I should say is that, as I keep saying, George's mind was fragmented. It was like shattered glass. And I had real trouble because the doctors of the old days kept saying he was incoherent, he was incoherent. Nothing he said made sense. And so it seemed until I read um, a piece by a man called Joshua Glidden, who is a, an Australian editor, who happens to know what it's like to have a psychotic experience. And he said that when I'm ill, my mind is like an ill-fitting jigsaw puzzle and I can't make it fit together in any way that made sense. And when I read Josh, Josh's words, I looked back at what George had been telling these people for years and suddenly I could see that the little pieces of the jigsaw puzzle weren't fitting but if you just adjusted them a little bit he was he was telling his story as well and he was telling his story in this kind of fractured way and at one point and and, and the problem was that they weren't really listening to him and I tried to listen to him. And when you did listen to him, the story came through quite clearly. Thank you very much. Now, if we have questions, maybe if you have a question, you can say it and I'll repeat it on the microphone so everyone can hear it and then either David or Alex can answer. Does anyone have a question here in the front? I can just pass you. Hi, I want to ask a question about uh, post-war um, stress issues. Uh, these days, if someone is having a mental issue, we sometimes say they're losing their marbles. But um, there was an older phrase, which was that somebody was doolally. And I understand that that was the name of an Indian mental health hospital, mental hospital, where many New Zealanders went uh, after the First World War. And I wondered whether the people we've been hearing about uh, were ever at do Lally. <laughs> it is an Indian place. I've heard that as well. Do you know anything about no, it? No. Um, George certainly wasn't at Do Lally. <laughs> he certainly wasn't there. No. But was he Do Lally? <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. That's a term my father used to use the the, fr yeah, the word Do Lally actually. Yeah, yeah. I know the word. Yeah. Uh, no, um, Alexander Aiken was a goose alley, not Do Lally. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Can I just say, in case you're thinking about asking a question, I can't recommend these books highly enough. They're both incredibly gripping. And in both of them, you have this very immediate and real sense of someone who lived 100 years ago. Alexander Aitken is a fantastic writer. And then David has done so much to bring, to piece together a story for George. It's a very anti-heroic story, as you say, very ag against the Anzac myth, but is the story of many men who served, who were scared and not necessarily ready for it. I should say briefly, my own great uncle, Bob, uh, went off to France as a teenager and he was a machine gunner. And I was telling Graham Lee this earlier, he sent a letter to my grandfather at one point to say, don't bother joining up. It's not as good here as you think. <laughs> <laughs> he came back unscathed. I think he was one of the 2%. Um, but my English grandfather fought in France in World War I, was gassed and was a destroyed man after World War I. And I think many families, many of our families have that in common, that there's someone in the family who was ruined. And then there's the whole generation of Miss Jean Brodies who had no one to marry as well. <laughs> any, any questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, I have a question for Alex. Um, 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 
I know the book was um, the 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 book of the song was well received in England and by quite famous people like A.G.B. Taylor. Um, was there any reception in New Zealand? Any any reviews and? Uh, yes, there were. Um, so, particularly with the Ferguson connection, and so the book was well received here, um, and also in Australia, and in uh, South Africa. So, um, it did it did really well. Um, but then, it has disappeared from our consciousness, in yes. a way, mm. which is why we need your new edition. <laughs> Um, after this, uh, both David and Alex will be happy to sign copies of books. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. You know, they're very difficult, so I'm just making sure. <laughs> there are also uh, more uh, refreshments, or well, I hope there are. <laughs> so would you like to say something? Can I pass the microphone over to you? Uh, yes, please. So this is a, a statement rather than a question. I have published several uh, accounts of Aitken in various journals, and after the centenary celebrations of Aitken at the University of Edinburgh, I decided we really need a, a reprint of Gallipoli to the Song. I suggested to Oxford University Press, please reprint the uh, Gallipoli to the Song. There was a very blunt reply, it would not make a profit, and so we will not reprint it. Mm. That is a brief summary. I then wrote to the New Zealand Chief of Staff, telling of the book, and uh, asking whether it might be possible for the New Zealand Army to provide a subsidy to Oxford University Press and reprint it. The New Zealand Chief of Staff said, a, a uh, very warm re uh, reply telling his own admiration of the book, but regretting that uh, he did not have any authority to uh, authorise uh, money to be paid to Auckland University Press to reprint the book. So I am absolutely delighted that Alex Taylor has uh, now uh, reprinted the book and that Auckland University Press had the uh, honour of uh, reissuing it. Mm. And just one further comment uh, about the rumour that uh, uh, Aitken was involved at Bletchley Park. I've read a great deal about Bletchley Park and I've seen nothing uh, hinting that uh, Aitken was one of the people involved there. Right. That's a shame. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much, and would you all join me in thanking Alex Calder and David Hastings. going out tonight. We had a little medical emergency back there, but it all went well. And uh, and thanks to the Devonport Library Associates who uh, put on the biggest library events in Auckland by a mile. And uh, it's great to see everybody come out for this. And uh, for Paula for chairing the event, my lovely authors, David and Alex, uh, for their books. And then we have the new owners of Paradox Books at the back who have a big stack uh, to sell to you all. So I just encourage you to get down there, get a book, get it signed and uh, grab yourself a glass of wine. Thanks again for coming out. Thank you.